About a year ago, I was introduced to True Niogen, a supplement specifically designed to boost a key cellular resource called NAD. That's short for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And I was really impressed with the research that showed that increased NAD levels can promote cellular repair, maintain healthy mitochondria, and increase energy throughout the trillions of cells in our body. I've been taking True Niogen ever since, and I am truly persuaded which is why I'm so excited to welcome them back to the program. Let's get into how True Niagen works. From age 40 to 60, humans can experience a 50% decline in NAD, leaving our cells with a shortage of that incredibly valuable energy resource. Additionally, things like immune stress, poor diet, even alcohol consumption can all deplete our cell NAD levels. Research suggests that increased NAD can support cellular defense against these physiological stressors. True Niagen is designed to boost NAD levels and is backed by clinical research and regulatory approvals. Now, while the research is still evolving, I am truly impressed by the possibilities surrounding NAD and the research behind True Niagen. And I suggest you check out their information for yourself. To learn more about the research, science, and to order your supply of True Niagen supplement, visit drdrew.com slash trueniagen and use the code DREW at checkout for a special discount on orders of three bottles or more. So that's my website, drdrew.com slash T-R-U-N-I-A-G-E-N and use the code DREW today. Hey, everyone. It's a dose of Dr. Drew. Hey, I'm seeing you all in here. Hi, Jeans. Hi, uh, Jessica, Micah, Gary, Gina. Hi, everybody. Uh, we have a special guest today. We're going to do the uh, sort of COVID review at the end today rather than up front. Uh, it is none other than the great Vinnie Tordrich, the NSNG, no starch, no grain, the brains behind it, the brains behind Fitness Confidential, uh, the podcaster, the read all the stuff, uh, Susan, help me. Oh, the oh, fat the up. documentary. Okay, we have fat the documentary. We have Pure Coffee Club. Pure we Coffee have Club, Fitness Confidential book and podcast, and Pure Vitamin Club. There you are, Pure Vitamin, Pure Coffee. Vinny, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me, Drew. It's, it's great being here. And Susan, whenever we do these podcasts, we don't have to go through my my whole list <laughs> of every business well, you, I own. You know it's not a bad idea. This, this, is not, this is not just the Corolla crowd. I feel like Chuck. This is this is a crowd that may not know you so well. I know. I feel like a schmuck with all that. Yeah, but it's, this is the time. You're you're right on. You're in you're in the groove right now. They're saying, by the way, Susan. The well, that, that's good to, to hear. Oh, and Steve is a fan of the Pure Vitamin Club. That's awesome. We're a fan of the Pure Coffee Club. We drink that constantly. Uh, We're looking for ways to help people. And Christine is saying, well, the, when the mo murder hornets uh, don't upset us, they're going to have uh, shark nados and land <laughs> sharks. And so uh, I, think, I think finally somebody's caught on to what the press is up to. So, Vinny, where are you now? I am in Central Virginia, and believe it or not, while I'm talking to you, Drew, I'm actually mounting a scope onto one of my rifles. Nice. So that, that's what I'm up to today. I'm multitasking right now. <laughs> I want so, you to come over here with one of those. <laughs> uh, so, Pete, again, this is not all the Corolla crowd that uh, piles into these, these streams. So talk to them a little bit about how you came to the uh, no starch, no, no grain diet. Well, you know, I, I've been working as a, a fitness trainer in Hollywood, uh, you know, with you know mainly celebrities for for thirty years, and and it it just somewhere around year, you know, I started doing this back in New Orleans when I was there for ten years before this, and my idea was it's easier to keep people lean or get them lean if we're not trying to chase a bad diet. In other words, you can exercise all you want. But, you know, if you're chasing, if you're eating badly, you're never going to lose weight. As a matter of fact, you're going to become more unhealthy. And I saw that with a lot of my clients who would say, hey, get me ready for a marathon. These people, in some cases, were running between 40 and 60 miles a week towards the end. And I noticed that their weight would go up. And not only that, wow. I noticed that when I got went to the race to cheer them on, other people were at the race and I, I would look at them and my comment was always the same. These are people who are trying to stay in shape and none of them look as good as the crowd in 1968 at Woodstock and nobody there was exercising. Right. So exercise is clearly not how we lose weight. 
And, uh, and I just went back to what I heard my, my grandparents from Italy, you know, they would always go, Hey, if you want to put weight on, eat some more pasta, get some hips, Mm. you know, eat some pasta. And it was like, well, let's just do the opposite of that. And I started (laughs) going down that road. Uh, one of my first people, uh, that I looked at, you know, Dr. Atkins, you know, was clearly out in 1970 saying this. And every now and then you would read a report from someone like Stephen Finney and Jeff Lowlett from the early 90s where they were dealing with this kind of stuff. And and um, I started playing around with it, and lo and behold, it, it was the truth, you know, and uh, just started how, how going down that road. How did we get so road. far off that? Was it, now, you know, our, our mutual friend Kate Shanahan thinks a big part of the problem are the seed oils and the, in the you know, the uh, corn syrups and things like that. Is it... More than that? Well, Kate is right on target um, because seed oils are part of it. You know, we we brought it in all at the same time. That, that's the crazy part behind the story. As you know, you were in my movie, Fatter Documentary. And, you know, we, we just showed a 100-plus year history of how we went wrong. And, you know, in the 19, late 1950s, whenever... Um, uh, president, uh, our president had a heart attack. Um, we started looking for what caused heart attacks. Mm-hmm. And there was a guy named Ansel Keys who came in <clears throat> and he basically said, Hey, take out anything, you know, saturated fats are bad. So, well, seed oils don't have saturated fats. They have poly unsaturated fats and mono unsaturated fats. So we said, okay, we need fat. We do know that, but let's cut out the fat that ha- actually works and let's go to another fat because for no reason whatsoever, we think that saturated fat is bad. Mm. There was no science around that. Mm. Uh, so Kate Shanahan is 100% on target with what she's talking about. Seed oils are an abomination, uh, to put it mildly. Um, but at the same time, we started saying, well, so saturated fat is bad. Meat is also bad. Right. So maybe we should stay away from meat. And and in the history of this country, we started in the 1960s, the hippie movement, and things became, you know, quote unquote, crunchy granola, everything. Yeah. You know, yeah. live off of mother nature and don't, let's not kill animals. So, you know, we, you know, PETA was coming in around the same time saying, hey, you know, sentient beings should live and we should all live in harmony. Mm-hmm. So the hippie movement had as much to do with it as anything else. You know, it, it all culminated at the same time. Uh, and uh, industry had a great and easy time going with it. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, why, and why not? Right. Right. And it, it, it sounds good. It's funny. We're, we're so <laughs> accustomed to hearing it. it you know, and, and I know many cardiologists are still signed on to plant diets being superior to animal-based diet. How, how, and, and, yeah. and I'm imagining that as much as anything, if you keep your weight down and keep your insulin down, that really is what makes the difference. No. Yeah. Well, we can, we can point a straight line to, you know, having a, a larger weight to circum- waist circumference and, and, and cardiac, uh, episodes, you know, there's that, a direct correlation there, but try to get the New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA or the World Health Organization who the whole world learned about in the past month or two or anyone else to to follow along. And they they just keep preaching the same thing. You know, hey, uh, Mediterranean diet, whole foods. And when you go, okay, what are those whole foods? Well, you know, whole vegetables and whole grains and whole, you know, and, and it's just, it, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, play out it doesn't weigh out and i, I tell you that the, you know, gra- the grain part every year the grain part on. is the is the part that gets people <clears throat> off the off the track i can't tell me how many obese patients i have they're like i don't know i i have a giant bowl of oatmeal every morning it's good for my cholesterol and i just put some honey and strawberries in it what's the big deal i put you, eric if any of you uh are f- familiar and, and that's a thousand calories yeah, it, bad calories so it, it is it's a lot it's you're right, Drew. It is a lot of calories. It's it and but we've all you know. Look, go back to any sitcom in the 1980s. 
you know, uh, you know, our friend Adam Carolla would say, yeah, they did a lot of souffle humor. Right. But the other humor was, hey, I'll have the, the, the sirloin steak with a cardiologist on the side. Right, you know, that, right. that was the other joke That's that right. they would make. Yep. Everything was, do you, you know, do you serve that with a doctor? You know, and, yeah. and so, you know, and that's just pop culture doing what pop culture does. So what do you think a, a, a 400 pound guy uh, is going to say, <clears throat> look, I've had 400 pound people tell me, Hey, I went to my doctor and I'll say, what did your doctor say? So well, my, my doctor checked all my vitals and says, I'm the picture of health. And I would go, you got to be kidding me. You're not the picture of health. Not yeah. if you weigh 400 pounds, no. doctors, you know, you know it, it, and they're not, you know, and, and we could get into, you know, this whole COVID thing we're going through right now, you know, you know, it, it, it pissed me off early on. It was about a month, maybe a month and a half ago. Uh, I saw the BBC said, that, you know, it's not just young people dying. We have this 50, this 50 or 48 year old woman who dropped dead of COVID-19. And, uh, you know, she's not over 65. And, you know, they're saying only older people are dying. And I looked at her picture. And, you know, bless her heart, but she weighed 400 pounds if she weighed an ounce. And I was like, well, wait, how can they say she was perfectly healthy? By definition, she's not perfectly healthy. Right. You and, know, and, and, so, and Kate was making a big point, you know, too. She was saying, because antiphospholipid antibodies and cytokine activation is the big complication in this uh, illness. <laughs> and she has a theory that these seed oils are actually intercalating into our membranes, our cell membranes, and are the source for the anti-cardiolipin stuff that we're seeing with when these people get really sick. Uh, so it's kind of interesting uh, that we, there may be an opportunity here to really turn your fat intake around to just, she said, tallow, butter, and uh, olive oil. That's it. That's your fat. And lose some weight. I mean, there's a real opportunity to protect yourself here. Yeah, and I don't hear one epidemiologist saying any of this. It's all shelter in place, yeah. don't go anywhere, and you know, it's just not making any sense. And, and look, I'm I'm not the smartest guy, you know, in the game, <laughs> but I, I do feel like I have some common sense. Yeah, and I think most people out there have common sense, and they have to stop feeding us like babies. Look, we've done what the what the experts asked us to do. They said, "Hey, listen." You know we're gonna we're gonna shelter in place and and flatten the curve. Well, Drew, you can help me out here. In my opinion, that curve has been flattened. Do do you think it's been flattened? Oh yeah. We, see, I I'm a little confused by what our goals are now because we achieved the goal. The original goal was do not exceed the bed and ICU capacity and ventilator capacity, which we beautifully did. There was except in two hospitals in New York, yeah. there was never even close to a, a problem with hospital beds or ventilators or ICU beds. So uh, mission accomplished. Hey, can we, they they can never we, said they were trying to reduce deaths. Right. They never said that, but it seems like it did morph into that, and, and that's a viable and that's a reasonable goal, right? You want to reduce deaths, reduce cases. That's fine, but how aggressive do they want to be with that and how realistic is it? Because we don't know whether isolation will have a added benefit above just masks and distancing. We just don't know that. Crazy, right? Well, we've reduced, we've reduced death right now. Yep. <clears throat> now, my understanding of any flu that comes around, we all get it at some point. So we're going to get it. So I, my dream is that we come up with some kind of medical solution so that my yeah. parents don't die from that. No, no, that's right. That's what we need. And, and there, are, there are, there we are in the second <clears throat> wave of about a half a dozen really interesting therapeutics coming out. So it, it's coming. It's coming. Uh, there's some data ready to, bro ready to blow. <laughs> and we'll see. It's A lot of it is on that cytokine system. It, Drew, can, can I ask you something? And if it's inflammatory, I know you've been through the mill on this and, and, uh, and it pisses me off, but I'm going to if this is too inflammatory, just tell me. Um, but a friend of mine who is a hospitalist in Los Angeles, one of the biggest hospitals, I won't give the name. Mm. I said to her, I said, why is it that Los Angeles is not having the deaths that everyone else is having? And she said to me, well, we've been using hydrochloroquine with 
azithromycin, and zinc, 230 milligrams of zinc, for the past month. And I said, how's that working out? And she says, it's working out great. Okay, so and I said, why doesn't everyone do that? Right. And she said, because New England Journal of, she, this is the way she put it, the New England Journal of Socialism won't, won't write it out. <laughs> All right, so, so it's a little more is complicated. Any... <laughs> it's a little more complicated. So here, here's the deal. Yes, there's tons of it being used. Uh, I've used it myself on COVID cases, and I believe it worked. I've used hydroxychloroquine for 30 years. Uh, I've talked to a rheumatologist that has 1,000 patient years collected, has not seen one side effect. I've never seen one side effect. And there's a difference between chloroquine, for which there is cardiac side effect, and hydroxychloroquine, for which none has ever been documented, except in people that already have a prolonged QT interval. QTC is, is long, like a methadone patient. So you need an EKG before you go on it. That's it. Otherwise, there's no downside that we know of. Now, there's also, we don't know if there's an upside either, right? And so whenever we do something, we have to be able to do a risk-reward ratio. And most of the people that, a, 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 mo, nearly all the people that got hydroxychloroquine get better. But get what get guess what, Vinny? Nearly all the people that get COVID get better, right? It's 98% of the population that gets it recovers. Right. So it's 2% somewhere in there that has trouble. And that 2% is in a very significant risk category, and we need to be doing altogether different things with them. So it's, it's complicated. It's complicated. And we don't have the real data yet. Uh, and so, you know, practicing proper medicine, you want to wait for the data. And I understand that. So it may not have that much. I, my prediction is it's not going to have a lot of an effect. It's going to have a little effect. Um, and we need things more like remdesivir. That, that's sort of the beachhead that we've claimed. It's much like AZT was the beachhead for AZT, for uh, HIV. And once we had that principle, we could build off it and make combinations. And then at the same time, we have these IL-6 inhibitors and the CCR5 inhibitors and the JAK inhibitors. We have all these cytokine inhibitors that we're going to begin to use in combination. We just don't know what we're doing yet. So until we have the data with that stuff, it's going to still be a little bit of a fog of war. Hey, we have uh, another guy on the line. Maybe we can talk to him and go back to COVID. Yes, let's talk to Scott King. Scott, are you there? I'm here. How are you? Hey, tell us your story. There's a reason you're here. Uh, yeah, so um, you just want me to run through my, my history, I guess? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so uh, my name is Scott. I'm 42 years old, uh, married, have three little girls. And I've uh, been pretty gigantic my whole entire life. Uh, back in 2006, I believe, I had gastric bypass. <clears throat> At uh, the day of my bypass surgery, I was 552 pounds. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And I got down to a low of 276, which for me is tiny. I know by conventional thought it's not, but for me that's, Tiny, tiny, and then um, like like so many people with that have had gastric bypass, uh, slowly but surely started putting on more weight and more weight and more weight, and uh, uh, probably about two years ago now, I tried to have gastric bypass again, and I was denied by the insurance company, and I just kind of chalked it up to, there, you know, that's kind of sealing my fate. That's how I'm gonna just kind of go out. Eventually, just just dwindle dwindle down and something will take me out with my weight and uh then i was listening to your show you and uh, you and adam actually and you had Vinny on and uh what he was saying made sense i i've heard of the keto diet before but i i looked into it and it was just a whole lot of figuring stuff out and i'm that's just not who i am and i know i would fail near instantly but i liked how his was just pretty much a list of don't eat this and you can't have this and i guess um Pretty much a last ditch effort was I gave it a shot, um, and the eight that was eighteen months ago. I gave it a chance. Uh, my weight, I'm assuming, was at least four fifty. I, I I maxed out my doctor's scale at four fifty, so I can't tell you my true weight. But um, I was four hundred and fifty eighteen months ago, and uh, as of today, I'm two seventy two. Wow! And uh, fantastic, wow. man. Yeah, it's just it's. It's, it's uh, still, I'm probably more shocked than anybody else because, you know, diets don't work for people like me. So I don't know 
I was, you know, I was pushing it too much. It's working, and I'll, I'll take advantage of that. Yeah, has it been easy for you or difficult? That's the scary thing. It has been incredibly easy. Um, my first two or three weeks of it, uh, I would say the most difficult, and that was just because I just had to kind of retrain with my way of thinking. Uh, as a morbidly obese guy, everything's overcomplicated about how to lose weight. So I was trying to overthink this the whole entire time, and then once you kind of get used to your new way of life, you realize how incredibly easy NSNG really is. It's perhaps the most simple way of eating I've ever done. And um, two to three weeks down the road, like Vinny says, my I didn't dabble with anything. I didn't mess with any sweets, no diet sodas, nothing like that. And I completely lost the cravings for uh, for sugary and starchy foods. And and um, you know, I get to eat what you know. <laughs> I, I'm not surprised whatsoever. I'm hungry. I eat. I just eat the right things. And it's, uh, I, I mean, for me, it's nothing short of a miracle that it's working. I, I, I'm beyond grateful for the newfound life that I've, I've gotten with this. Vinny, did you know Scott before this? I, I did. Uh, uh, because, you know, Scott, like many other people, they come to, they come to me via Twitter usually, or some other form of social media. And um, I started, I guess I started following Scott maybe 50 or 60 pounds ago um, when he started posting pictures. And and we, we did a podcast with Scott. And, you know, because, it, you know, the, the best thing I can do is, you know, I do five shows a week, five podcasts. And one of my most popular shows is the Saturday show because, you can have, you know, the Kate Shanahan's on all day Friday, the, the Dr. Drew's on Friday, and, and I do all the other shows during the week. But when they hear another, you know, as I call them, lay people, another yeah. lay person just yeah. saying, hey, I'm just a dude, I'm a trucker, I'm a this, I'm a that, and I just, I just did this, and it worked. You, you know, that's when, that's when you get to get other people on board, and that's how I know Scott. Uh, and not only that, Scott has been such a, a great megaphone for the whole low carb community, not just in S and G, but just across the board. You know, just when when you have those pictures online and you're putting them up every day, you're basically holding a mirror up to everybody else who says, "I'm going to wait until tomorrow." And Scott, the part of your story I think you left out, and I might be conflating your story with mm -hmm. someone else's. Are you the one where your child ran out into the road and you couldn't get him or her fast enough? Oh boy. Yeah, that that was me. Um, I was trying to trying to make my summary a little shorter, but yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the 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 final straw for me was uh, we were sitting outside and my my daughter, my baby daughter, who at the time was uh, two years old, uh, she ran for the road. Thank God I don't live on a busy road. Nothing came about it. But I realized at that moment when I tried to get up and go after her, you know, I couldn't get out the chair fast enough, let, let alone run after her. And um, and when I say this, I'm not saying that overweight people are not good parents. I'm just saying I felt, me personally, I felt a failure as a father that I can't even protect my kids in the most basic way. And then beyond that, um, I was just feeling an early fate and, you know, Definitely, I can almost guarantee it's some horrible, um, you know, non-quality of life for my kids, whether that be early death or illnesses or stuff that my kids shouldn't really have to be part of because of my poor eating and my obesity. And um, I just knew at that moment that I had to change, like now. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, it's, it's... Drew, Drew, if I could jump in. Please. Scott, uh you know, when I, I hear stories like, like yours, you know, and you go, well, you know, it was poor eating, but you didn't think, I mean, look, you're a guy who went to a doctor and had either a sleeve or some, one of the ga gastric things done, either the phobic pouch or whatever they did to cut a piece of your stomach out. That's a desperate measure. I'm guessing you were trying to eat what they were telling you to eat. Is that correct? Or were you just, Hey, you know, th this is, uh, 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 you know, Caligula's den, and I'm just going for it. I mean, what? How how did it work for you? 
don't get me wrong. You know, I take the blame for a lot of it because I tested my limits and started stretching my stomach out. But for the most part, yeah, you're right. I mean, I like kind of like your oatmeal example. Uh, you know, I'm eating good. I'm eating oatmeal. I'm doing everything I should. Why is this not working? And uh, yeah, it's just, I'm, I, I just was at a loss. I, I, okay, maybe my quantities were a little bit high, but how come I'm hungry all day long and I'm eating everything I should be eating? I'm eating healthy and it's just, yeah, just kind of throwing my arms up in the air in confusion of why it's not working so, and what so am I doing Vinny, wrong. Vinny, where, where does it really go off just, the rail, t- yeah. rail typically for people? How do, how do they think they're eating healthy, but in fact they're eating all this uh, high carbohydrate, insulinogenic food? Well, you know, that's, that's, that's always the interesting question. And I, over, over the years now, I've interviewed not hundreds, but thousands of people. And, uh, it, it, you know, the, the words I use at the beginning of every one of my podcasts is your good intentions have been stolen. And I'm just trying to help you get them back. No one wakes up in the morning and says, hey, man, I, I love the way it feels when I've been over and try to tie my shoes and I almost pass out, almost black out. No one likes that feeling, yeah. you know, and no one likes the feeling of people staring at them in a grocery store. And, you know, I have a brother who's morbidly obese. And during the COVID thing, I begged him to stop going to work. And he says, I'm not going to stop going to work. Mm. And I said, why? He goes, what do you think people think about fat people? I said, they think you guys are lazy. And he goes, that's right. I'm the best salesman in my division. I'm the guy. If I don't show up for work, and this is the guy that never misses a day at work. He can, you know, you know and that's the, and no one likes that. No one likes the stigma. No one likes the way they feel. So they start doubling down on what we've been told is correct. Yeah. Eat the Mediterranean diet, get more grains, more quote unquote, heart healthy grains. You know, you can eat this, you can have Gatorade because there's no fat in it. It's only sugar. Right. And, you know, people do what they've been told. Yeah. And they've been told the wrong thing. I, I'm amazed how being, I, I mean, I, I know, I'm not sure that, well, I like carbohydrates. I like them a lot. And I, and I would only occasionally have really concentrated, you know, bread or, or, or cake or sweets, that kind of thing. But it doesn't take much. Uh, you have to sort of consciously eliminate it. And very quickly, you feel a lot different. You do, you know, and, even people who aren't really affected, you know, um, uh, Lynette Carolla, a mutual friend of, of ours, she can eat pasta around the clock and her waist stays the same size. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But as I'm always trying to explain to people like her, you can't, you know, you, you will pay the piper. It's, it doesn't mean you're not going to get fatty liver disease. It doesn't mean you, you're not going to get hypertension right. or sleep apnea or any of the other problems that come along with it you you it looks like you're beating it from the outside but from the inside you can still get all the problems and, and to be uh, to, to 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 be more granular on what you were saying drew guys like you and me you know we feel too much sometimes you know it's yes i can eat you know if i have a piece of cake or a piece of pie i almost have to go lay down and take a nap you know, because I'm just not used to it. I, my body, just my brain, none of it can really handle it anymore because I've been away from it for so long. I, I even if I, I don't know, I, I have to be really careful because I, I do feel totally different when I move away from the proteins and stuff. And, and I, and I also, I don't know, Scott, do you, is there anything you tend to overdo? I know I overdo the protein intake. Uh, I'll, I will use that as a way of managing appetite when I should be using fat. Yeah, I, I could tend to go a little high on protein sometimes as well um, and not focus on the fat. Um, yeah, I'm in the same boat. Yeah, the protein, I will watch a little bit because it's, it's, it's kind of easy sometimes to overdo it. Vinny, help us. Well, you know, the thing about protein is, you know, it, look, we need a, it, it's the building block, you know, the three macronutrients that we consider for our body. Protein is, is the building block. But, and so that's a good thing. We, we, you hear it all the time. You, you know, hey, you want to have healthy hair and healthy nails, more protein. You want to build muscle, protein. So we think of protein as being this athletic do-all thing. And, and yes, we do need protein. But, you know, for any person getting, you know, just the average person, I'm not talking about, 
you know, a, a guy who swims in the Olympics or anything else, but right. just a normal guy like us. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're getting somewhere between, you know, 75 and 100 grams of protein per day, and, and you can easily get that, you know, uh, that's way more than enough. Or some people like to measure it per pound of lean body mass. So, you know, if you're getting 0.5 grams of protein per pound of lean body mass, that's more than enough. Um, and if you're getting more than that, you know, gluconeogenesis can come into effect. And, right. and a little gluconeogenesis is not bad. I'm sure I have a ton of you know, that. It'll add, you know, if, go on. I'm sure I have a ton of that going on. Look at the Genesis. Yeah, I, I think I think we, you and me, I think we talked about it one day, yeah. in when I was when we we were in the studio together, where you said, "Hey, I'm, I'm I'm I feel like I'm putting a little weight back on in my waist," and you started talking about just the amount of protein you were eating. You actually you nailed uh, me you on the, the you, fat, you actually nailed you, me on the cream. I was overdoing the heavy cream. Oh, okay. That, that, yeah, I, I talked to so many people the other day. Yeah, that's the other thing. You can't, the, the, at the end of the day, there's nothing you can do with impunity. Right. You know, and I well, think that's, you know, we all want that because we, the, the diet culture has taught us that, hey, you can have, you know, Weight Watchers, you can have all the brownies you want as right. long as you don't go past your point. So, right, right. You know, so we've, 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 that's been just, you know, just ingrained in our head. Well, I, I have, and it's not good. I have found that, you know, I lift weights a lot and that, that stimulates my appetite and running suppresses my appetite. So I, I have to kind of get that balance right too for me. Hey, Tony asked a really good question here. He says, is it possible that low carb diets are just giving fo folks structure who can't structure their eating habits? There's something to that. Yeah, I, I think it does because, you know, be, before... Look, it's the only way you can eat where, look, if you eat high carbs, you, you, you know, you have to control them because think about it. If the example I use, let me give a great example of this. Um, if I gave, uh, is, is his name Tony? If I get Tony a, a bag of potato chips, a, a bag of Doritos, right? And it's the family bag. And I think we've all been there in our life. The family bag of Doritos has 17 ounces of corn chips in it. And you're sitting there watching the, the football game on a Saturday afternoon. And before you know it, you've emptied that bag. Susan, you know anything about and corn chips, do you? You know that if there was. That's my go to. Say again? <laughs> That's Susan's thing corn chips. So, Susan, you know what I'm talking about. You can say you're going to have five, right? And before you know it, you're mowing through a bag of it, right? I don't have that problem, but I like so, to have them every day. Hey. Uh, well, some people have that problem. Yeah. <laughs> right. I know. You, you know, Can we're I... not all perfect. Like, you know, Sue is beautiful and she's perfect. Now we know that every part of her is perfect. But for the rest of us. She's, she's like, you know, she when, is when like the. Start eating I'm telling you something. Chips, she is like the flux capacitor in Back to the Future. She, she can pour garbage in and it just turns to <laughs> nuclear energy. That's, that's it. Uh, hey, Scott, I'm going to let you go. And we, she still looks like that. I yeah. know. We're, Scott, we're going to let oh, you go. You're so kind. I, I appreciate you spending a little time with us. You want to give any last comments before I do let you go here? We've got calls lined up for Vinny. Go ahead. Oh, no, not at all. I just want to say thank you very much. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate all that you guys do. And, uh, you know, your willingness to help everybody and uh just i'll just keep spreading the, the word and uh hoping people see the light all right buddy keep going man Thanks, congratulations Scott. it's the other thing about this diet is that it's easy to it's easy to stay on it every other diet i've ever been is on off on Absolutely. off this has just been i've been almost th what, two three years in this i can't even remember it just can i ask scott a question oh scott one more question how is your cholesterol yeah. Uh, you know what? I actually had a blood panel done about a, about a month and a half or two months ago, and it came back flawless. Uh, like I was well under all the bad, and I was over the good. I, I don't know my exact numbers, but um, I did that intentionally because I got tired of hearing everybody saying, "Oh, your cholesterol is going to be horrible." Yeah, you lost weight, but your blood pressure is going to be high. Your cholesterol is horrible. And uh, I'll be honest, when I was waiting for those results, I was sweating bullets a little bit. But when I came back, I was able to pretty much shut everybody up about it. What was the gastric bypass procedure you had? Um, I 
trying to go off of my memory, but I think it's called something like the, the Ruin Y. Yeah, the Ruin like Y. Yeah, yeah. The Ruin Y patients uh, can have low cholesterol just by virtue of that, pr that procedure, too. So, oh, okay. So that may be part of it. Not so, that. But you haven't done it yourself any disservice. Anyway, that's, that's uh, part of the deal. So, okay, man. Thanks, Scott. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Great right, God buddy. bless you. Thank you. Uh, and Susan, do I just use the on-call thing the way we normally do? Do yes. I have to do it? Okay. We have a few calls there. Question for Vinny. This is, let's get her, get her up. Toby, what's going on there? Hi, Vinny. This is Toby. Hi, Hi Toby. Andrew. Hi, Toby. I'm a big fan of Vinny from way back. He's been really helpful to me. So thank you, Vinny. I really appreciate it. Is this the Toby uh, I see on Twitter every night and I've met at a few different Corolla events? This, this is me, Vinny. This is me. How you doing, Miss Toby? Fan. Yes. I'm I'm doing well. <laughs> I'm doing really well. Hey, I have a question. Right. And um, this is Vinny's fault, but Vinny had a doctor on his podcast. Um, the doctor's name is Dr. Jason Sung, who introduced us to the idea of fasting in conjunction with NSMG, yeah. which has worked like a magic bullet for me, where um, I think I'm down 48 pounds Good with a combination nice. of two, which is fantastic. But I keep hearing that fasting during this COVID-19 pandemic can weaken the immune system. Mm. So I try to do four days a week. I try, I, I'm anywhere between 72 and maybe 96 hours a week. What would be your suggestion? Should I cut out fasting for now until this is over? Or what should I do? Danny? Uh, that's a true question. <laughs> oh, uh, I, 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 I have... I've been thinking about these issues uh, because if you should get seriously ill with COVID, you need a lot of metabolic reserve. So I don't know that this is the time to be stressing your system. On the other hand, there's something called hormesis where you stress your body with cold water like Wim Hof or you stress yourself with running that actually sort of a good stress. So, so I, I have not resolved myself on this one yet. I, I would say just don't do prolonged fasting Keep your keep your um, nutritional elements up. You know, keep the protein up, keep the fats up, and then if you also want to do a little intermittent fasting, I'm sure that's fine. I'd rather you be uh, your weight be down than way up. That's for sure. Okay. So like between 18 and 24 hours, probably not a problem, but don't push it. Because sometimes 18, you know, I want 18, to be better I'm going to sign off. I'm going to sign off so. on. I'm going to sign off on 18, but but not. How often you want to do that? A couple times a week, once a week. Probably three, three times a yeah. week. Yeah. How much, do you mind if I ask how much you weigh? Drew, I need to lose 40 more pounds. All right, then stay with it. That's all right. Stay with it. I'm, I'm signing off on Toby. Okay. Stay close to Vinny. How about that? Uh, this is, uh, yeah. Jim, this is a whole different problem we never talk about. Jim, what's up? Hey, how's it going? We're good. What's going on there? Hi, Jim. Uh, yeah, no, I just had a question. I, you know, I'm in my mid to late forties and, uh, I have always been on the thin side. I'm six feet tall and, and, uh, always weighed about 170 pounds and well, I'm 165 to 170. And I dropped down to like around 160. Um, and you know, healthy, I get a physical every year and everything's good. And it's just odd. I think that most of my peers are, are putting on weight and I seem to be losing a little weight and wonder if you've heard about that before. So there there is be something, Vinny, there is something to those old endomorph and ectomorph ideas. It's, it's a, we're more sophisticated <laughs> yeah. about the genetics and the metabolism associated with it, but there's still something to all that. Talk, talk to us. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, you know, whether you're an endomorph, ectomorph, or, or one of the in-betweens, you could lose weight as you get older. My my question is, have you lost, how old are you, Jim? 45. Uh, 47. 47. Are, are you losing, are you muscle wasting at all? Are you losing any muscle mass or is it just, what's going on? Well, and let me frame, uh, let me frame no, it this no, way. No, no. Hang on, hang on. I know where Vinny's going. Have you always had difficulty losing weight? Or are you suddenly having noticing it's falling off and is it especially affecting muscle? No, I've I've always been thin. I always no, being thin know, is just, different. Yeah, uh, hang been, on, always been thin is different than I I can't keep my weight up. Right, that's a different thing. 
Uh, yeah. So if I understand the question, so I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I exercise, I, I run, lift, you know, I lift light weights. Um, but no, I wouldn't say I'm losing muscle. Okay. Um, right. uh, it's, it's, it's more, it, it's odd. I, I mean, I think it's, I, it's probably my, it, I think it's more on the, on the fat side of things. Vinny? Have you lost fat? Have you noticed your belt coming down a, a loop or two, this kind of thing? Where's that fat coming yeah. from? Yeah, so like, you know, okay. the, the, the belt buckle and, you know, in my face and, uh, and but, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I can still go to the gym and I'm active and it's, you know, other, everything else seems kind of normal. Um, it's just I eat, you know, I eat a, I guess a relatively balanced diet, uh, but I don't try to eat more to gain weight. But it's it seems like in the last, I guess over the last five years, it's it's like instead of instead of anticipating me hitting, you know, I've never hit 170 pounds in my life, uh, and now I'm hitting, you know, I'm usually around between 160 and 165, and I'm always like staring at that, hoping it doesn't go lower. <laughs> But you don't think, I mean, when you're in the gym, your strength is the same or better than it was, say, six months ago? Uh, yeah, probably, probably about the same, maybe a, a little, maybe a little better. And, you know, I run, you know, I'll run three miles a day. If I, I try to go to the, you know, if I try to exercise four days a week, it'll be, you know, a three mile run and then, and then some, you know, light weight. I would keep an eye on it. You know, you might want to up your protein. You know, you're the, you're the opposite of Drew. Yep. where he might be taking in too much protein. Yep. You might want to just up your protein. And, and by the way, you don't have to take any supplementation. You know, just eat more red meat, eat more fish, and see what happens, you know, and see if you can convert some of that, you know, training in the weight room into lean muscle mass. If you notice that you're not and you continue to fight to struggle at that weight, Make sure that go, go see an endocrinologist and yeah. have them do white blood cell yeah, tests yeah, and all get, that. And make sure a, you don't have one of the leukemias or any um, of that. I wouldn't jump right to that, but but just a general medical evaluation. Uh, just to I, be I sure. wouldn't jump right to it either, yeah. but you know, th yeah. there's got to be something there, Drew. Hey, maybe I, I, if I, you, I've, I've if had he continues to lose weight. I've had training partners that cannot get their weight up, and I literally used to coach them to drink you know Ensure milkshakes three times a day, in addition to eating as much as they could when they're when they're uh, taking in their usual, you know, their diet, their, their, their meals. And even then they would gain like five pounds. So there are, there are people like that that just can't gain weight. And I, and I always tell when I've worked with people like that, I, I tell them the same thing was you have to eat until you're nauseated. And that's usually what they experience. They experience nausea very easily with even moderately high uh, loads, uh, uh, meal loads. And they just have to, you know, if they want to gain weight, they have to really get at it. But I agree with you. If there's any issues to get a medical evaluation just to be sure it's not something causing the weight loss. Desiree. Hi. Or, de or desire. Is it de desire or Desiree? It's Desiree. Desiree. Okay, good. What's up? Hi, Dr. Drew. Um, I've been having a lot of health problems. I'm pretty young. I'm, I just turned 33. Um, my doctor has been kind of like, just kind of shrugging me off like oh you don't experience pain because you're young well now that I'm like hitting my 30s um she actually sent me to a physical therapist and I started doing yoga mm -hmm. I've been doing that for a year and a half and I still can't do the tree pose like basic standing on one leg I cannot balance myself have you seen a, and, hey, have you seen um, hang on have you seen a neurologist no okay well, and that, I can't I feel like I can't get them to take me seriously. Um, I haven't even been, in, I switched doctors um, from the one that got me, sent me to a physical therapist. And I'm going to another doctor at the same clinic, but because my insurance can only provide like that clinic and I live in a small town. Oh boy. Um, the doctor that I'm going to now, he started to take me seriously. Good. Um, but he, he works underneath my old doctor well i i again um, if you're having muscle issues and balance issues that is the domain of neurology and you should have a neurologist look at you you should get an emg and a nerve conduction test and there's other things that have to be done that are more invasive possibly but uh, that's where you should be going neurology okay 
that's uh, that's the best I can tell you that Desiree in you know a few minutes on a phone call. Uh, it must be very frustrating. I'm sorry you're dealing with that. That does not sound okay, frankly. Uh, Dan, question. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I was on the keto diet. Still am. Lost 40 pounds. Easiest thing I've ever done. But the question is this. I see a lot like Aldi and Costco has zero net carb bread now. Yeah. And I was Vinny just wondering stuff. about Vinny your loves about stuff net like carbs this. and wheat. Vinny loves stuff like this. Go ahead, Vinny. Do not play the net carb game. Um, it, it, it doesn't work. It, it, you know, that, that the, the industry always follows what's going on in the real world. So whenever they figured out everybody was going low carb, well, how do you sell something that's not low carb that you want to make low carb? Well, you, 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 you come up with some BS <laughs> deal right. and you go, okay, Carbs don't count if we subtract the amount of fiber in the carbohydrate. We, we just won't make that count. Well, if that was true, then pasta would be at a net carb right. and corn would be at a net carb. Yeah. I mean, you could go through uh, you know, any kind of bread would be at a net carb. So, you, you know, the FDA does not regulate any of that. You can, you know, as long as you can show that, then they'll go, oh, okay. Just like the FDA does not regulate them, you, you know, you can have a bowl of sugar and you can slap the keto label on that bowl of sugar and the government will allow you to sell it. It doesn't mean it's keto. Keto is not a word that's owned by anyone. Mm. So, uh, you know, anyone can call anything keto. Anyone can call anything paleo. Anyone can call anything vegan. Mm. And now they're doing that within the, the, the constraints of the FDA by saying, well, yeah, this has 10 carbohydrates, but there's eight grams of nine grams of fiber. Uh, so we're going to subtract that out and we're going to call it one net carb. And then we're going to slap keto on it because that's just neither here nor there. And again, as I always say, your good intentions have been stolen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so don't play that game. It's never worked, nor will it ever. Should we, should we talk a little keto just to make sure people don't get confused about that? Yeah. Um, when I wrote my book, Fitness Confidential, I wrote the book about 10 years ago and has been out for eight. I was loath to use the word ketogenic in it uh, because I knew that everyone was going to hammer me and say, he's telling you to go into ketoacidosis right. and that's, that can, you can die, you know, right, right. because a lot of doctors, ten, you got to go back 10 years, you know, and you, you Keto, ketogenic and, and ketoacidosis, most doctors put those in exactly the same category. You would be shocked at how many doctors still do that today. Well, and, and, um, and if I could piggyback a little so bit on I this, to, one, one, on. Of the, one of the things that Kate keeps yeah. pointing out is um, whether it's ketotic or otherwise, we don't ever give ourselves even an opportunity to break down our fat. We don't break down our, in the fat that's on our body we're never metabolizing because we're putting so much in. She's exactly right about that. So when keto diet basically came around, it was, you know, I started calling it NSNG, no sugars, no grains, because I was trying to soft sell it a bit in my book. And, and that became a terminology. At the same time, Dr. Laurie Cardane uh, was pushing uh, the word paleo and paleo diet. He wrote a great book on that. So paleo became another low carb word, just like Atkins. Um, the problem with all of it is that it gets bastardized um, in one way or another, you know, because everybody wants to know what, you know, just give me the one word answer. What should I do? Well, you should do vegan or you should do keto or you should do yeah. paleo. Yeah. But, you know, whether it's paleo, keto, NSNG or Atkins, they're all, they're all within, you know, rock throwing distance of each other. And they all work if you do them in their purest form. Right. Uh, but when you start dealing with the products that have been made around them, you know, like uh, it, it, there's a product called Keto Bricks out there. Well, they just put a lot of monk fruit and, you know, <laughs> stevia and everything else. So now you have this, this you know, you, you have this, this junk food that, that has more chemicals than anything real in it. You know, so you have to be careful. But keto, 
Keto means ketogenic. It means where your your body is using fat, is converting it to ketones, which your brain prefers to run on. And then instead of running on sugar, you can run on uh, ketone bodies, which you become like a Prius. You know, Prius runs on gas and electricity, and you get to go back and forth. Right. Did I explain that well, Drew, or did I, I like scatter it. I around like it. No, much? no, no, it's good. Good. I, you're, you're, good you're, yeah, very good at talking about this. Let me um, quickly take a COVID call, a SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, Aaron, you have an interesting question. Go ahead. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Dr. Drew. Thank you for taking my call. A, a, a two-part question. I'm hearing conflicting things from pretty respected doctors here in this LA area that yeah. I'm asking them about the antibody test. They're almost discouraging me from taking it because we don't know if you can't re get reinfected. And my question is simple. Shouldn't this be the easiest thing to test? Take a guy that was infected already, who didn't have a bad case of it, and who's willing to do it again, and give him the virus. See what happens. That, that is considered unethical in the sense that we don't know that that person, you know, we don't know what the outcome of that illness will be. You might be committing him to really serious illness. Who knows? So no, it's called Koch's posture. What well, if he had it already? What if he had it already because he has antibodies and he didn't have many symptoms? Why it, would he it, get worse the second time? We don't because he could because this is biology. Things happen. We don't know. And and by the same token, he could be resistant, right? He could just not get anything, right? Uh, but it's it, you're talking about testing. Why would he have antibodies? You're talking about testing Koch's postulate, right? So this is classic infectious disease. You take the infecting agent, you get the illness. Uh, you get immunity, you get exposed to the infectious disease, you don't get it. But because this is a new illness, we don't know how long these antibodies sustain immunity. You can test these antibodies for their viral neutralizing capacity for other coronaviruses, which is a pretty good test that you have immunity. But then again, we don't know how long it lasts. It's really just a function of our lack of experience with this illness and people afraid of the liability of telling somebody something definitive that turns out not to be true. I mean, people are pretty crazy right now. If you say somebody, you're immune for a year, and they get sick and end up in an ICU, you are in big trouble. And so nobody is willing to take that risk. What right is now. your guess? My guess is what you is have your guess? my guess without that that – here, I'm getting confused because let me tell you what was happening with me. So there are pretty good finger stick blood tests out there that have moderate false negative rates, some up to 30%, but most are less than that. And they're very specific, meaning if you have the antibody, that tells you you had the illness, right? By the same token, there's a blood test that is even more accurate. But I just, I just was looking at what the labs send out with that blood test today. And let me read you what they say. They say, oh, crap, I can't. Uh, this test has not, nah, it's going upside down on me. This test has not been reviewed by the FDA. Negative results do not rule out SARS-CoV-2 infection, particularly uh, in those who have been in contact with those with the virus. So a negative test doesn't rule out that you had it, they're telling you. So that means they have a false negative test. Is that a Roche test? This is the is Quest. The this, is, this, is, talking about? this is Quest, which I don't know what machine they're using. Follow-up follow uh, testing with a molecular diagnostic should be considered. So they're, everyone's hedging their bet right now. And so I, I get your frustration. I'm feeling it too. I've asked, like you have, I've asked lots of reputable people, what do we do with this confusion? I've not gotten a good answer, except people are saying the blood test is the most accurate. Viral neutralizing antibodies are really pretty good. And we're probably okay from the standpoint of immunity, but nobody's willing to go on the record and say that. Does that fit with what you're hearing, Aaron? Thank you. Can I? Yeah. Well, pretty well. The doctor's saying if you want to do it, do it. Um, I think it's more what you're saying. People don't want to put their neck out there yeah. and, and say something clinical, you know. And then well, we, cause, cause can we I make two comments quickly about weight loss because it's being discussed now? You bet. Sure. Okay, I, I lost over a hundred pounds and I kept it off for ten years. This is from so this is from someone who has experience. Number one, divorce exercise from eating in your head. Yeah. If you're not on a diet, it doesn't mean you shouldn't exercise. Yeah. Exercise is like taking a shower and brushing your teeth. It should be done every day whether or not you're on a diet. Number Agreed. two, Agreed. diet, worry about what you need to eat, what you should eat. First, stuff yourself up on salads and drink a lot of water. Then we could talk about going to Krispy Kreme. Eight out of ten <laughs> times you won't want to go. So before complaining about what you can eat. First, stuff yourself up, and then we'll have the conversation. 
Well, that's a, that's a great. Thank uh, you, Doctor Drew. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> I, I actually used to I used to try that. I used to I used to call that appetite management. I would say, well, I'm going to manage my appetite by eating a ton of vegetables, mm -hmm. but it didn't really work that as well as the NSNG. Kenny. By, by the way, Drew, I love that guy and I love his thoughts, but uh, that whole uh, call was brought to you by Dr. Mengele's trust. Oh, come on yeah. now. Come <laughs> hey, on let's now. give this to people and see what happens. <laughs> come on now. Come on now. So I went to the yeah, doctor. It would be great if we could do that, right? Well, I used to do that. It just didn't work all that well. It's better than nothing. And, and uh, he's right. You should drink lots of water. Yeah. He's right about the exercise. I totally agree with him on that. That's a, Exercise and diet are kind of, they're related, but also separate. Yeah, no, he, he, he is absolutely correct. I, I've always said you can't outrun a bad diet. And, uh, you know, he's close to what I always say. Exercise is like brushing your teeth and wiping your ass. Neither is, is necessary, but it's really good if he did do those things. So, um, you know, we, we, we are a use it or lose it thing. You know, we have yeah. to move. We have to get up and move every day. It doesn't matter how you do it. You could cut grass or, or you know, just go out for a walk or, you know, you know, just whatever you do to move around. We're not meant to sit around and, and computers and, and artificial intelligence and everything is making us sit right. more and more That's and right. more. So hey. he's absolutely correct about that. But you can stuff yourself with all the salad you want. Um, I, I know most people would do that and then still go to Krispy Kreme. So yeah, I, you see, have I, to address I can, the I can, problem I, I would at say a more I, granular yeah, level. I, I would always say I could never get full. But in fact, I was just eating the wrong stuff. Hey, Desiree, I see you on the uh, YouTube uh, comments here, and uh, I, I understand you're having foot drop also. Mult y listen, I, I didn't really tell you what I was thinking about what the possible neurological disorders are that you could have. You wrote on the restream here that multiple sclerosis is a possibility. Yes, that's a possibility. And when I said there's more invasive procedures that they have to do on you, that would be a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap, which is what they do as part of the MS workup spinal cord and uh, head MRI also. And um, and the other thing is to make sure it's not ALS, some sort of form for us of ALS. So, but that's why a neurologist will do all that. So the fact that you've been dealing with this for so long is actually a good thing because it means it's probably not something serious. So if something happened to me today, I wanted to mention because of his quest test question. Okay. Yep. I'm, I'm, my doctor gave me the quest uh, and, questionnaire. And test, yeah. I'm gonna go get it and also for my cholesterol. But she told me that pregnant women are not getting this. They get it, but they get it mildly. And, and yeah, so are they just getting you should know so. that there is a whole phenomenon around a receptor. Uh, you know, we know, everyone knows about the ACE2 receptor. There's been a lot of ink spilled about that where the virus gets in, but it also has this other receptor that is dependent on androgens and the androgen receptor physiology. And so androgen blockade may reduce the availability of that receptor, which is a necessary cofactor to this virus getting in the cell. I wondered, because I was aware that this disease did not affect pregnant women very much, whether the progesterone might also do the same thing. She was so saying maybe the estrogen. No. Well, yeah, could be the estrogen. That, that's right. The, it's anything that's anti-androgen could, could, be, could be part of the deal. Because I said progesterone. She said estrogen. Well, maybe. Because it, it, of the fact that... It, yeah, I, I think she's right. I think much. about it because the the it's anti-androgen. So yes, estrogen would be the thing. Uh, Vinny, we got to wrap this thing up, man. We uh, as always, I could chat with you forever. I always like talking to you. I, I miss you. When are you coming out here? As soon as uh, uh, we deem it safe to fly. Uh, I miss you guys. I miss being out there. So. The next right. time I'm there, I'll let Sue know immediately, and we'll set up something in person. For sure. Uh, not just doing one of these things, but we have to go grab a steak or something and just hang <laughs> out. And, and maybe we'll Don't be worry, the, I'll be there. Maybe the Corolla barbecue. Maybe we'll be here. Maybe that will actually happen. July 11th? Yeah, we'll see if that happens. Yeah, I, yeah, we do that family barbecue every summer, and I love being at that thing. And uh, so hopefully, hopefully that'll happen, and, and I will absolutely be there if that happens. All right, my friend, uh, I will see you. I'm going to do a little COVID update. Uh, I'll sign you off. And uh, is there a website you want to refer people to other than Fat the Documentary? I'm showing a picture of his book. Yeah, you can go to Vinny Torturet. Yeah, are, are you putting my stuff up soon? Your book. Is it yeah, up there? I'll put the, I'll put the whole collage. VinnyTorturet.com. Yeah, Sue has me taken care of. <laughs> yeah, VinnyTorturet.com. Go check it all out. And uh, 
you guys go do your thing, and I'm going to go off and do a little kayaking now. Yeah, buddy. All right, man. Talk soon. God, I'm jealous. Uh-huh. Later, guy. Okay, bye. bye. Love you. Uh, quick update on the COVID. I don't have a lot to say today beyond what we've already talked about. Um, the University of Washington, uh, I, I don't know what to make of their data right now. I'm going to be speaking to Dr. Murray tonight about the assumptions he had made in this data. Uh, my feeling is the assumptions he's making here are flawed. Uh, the fundamental assumption that I think is going into his models that's making things so much worse is that movement, meaning moving about, which they actually have a graph of the amount of movement, social movement we're doing, equates to viral transmission. Uh, And the science, and I want to ask him about this, maybe he'll have the data. My understanding is there's no study that shows that isolation is different, different, quantitatively different than uh, distancing and masks. So if that's true, that you, now we start to move about and have closer contact out in the world, even though we maintain six foot distance and we have masks and we wear gloves and we wash our hands, that, that still there will be an increase in transmission. That may be just based on the fact that a lot of people don't practice you know, perfect social distancing. But I don't know about you, I look around and everyone is scared of everyone. They have freaked us out as a country, and I think people are generally practicing very careful social distancing if they go out at all. So I don't know that um, that I believe the deaths per day because that's also I don't I don't know if they put the uh, the, the necessary assumptions about uh, improvements in our therapeutics. So we'll talk to him tonight. Um, so as a result of that, I don't have much to say. If you have specific states you want me to look at, I certainly. <laughs> Problem is not so much of a surge, which is what we were the goal was to prevent, which mission accomplished, but more of a protracted course in places like Georgia and Massachusetts and Connecticut and places that we're worrying about. Here in California, for instance, uh, the the let me whoops, let me get it up here. The hospitalization rate is so low, it is just so low that I, I don't know what they're waiting for in terms of transitioning. Now, he has also a new category, which is presumptive infected, which is also pretty low in, in uh, California. And I don't know if that's a true number or it's something he's just trying on for size. Uh, in terms of hospitalization rate, I want to get you that very quickly. Hospital resource use in California is, is I mean, it's the same today. It's just low. It's, it's um, 2,000 beds needed. Um, you know, by the end of the month, we're going to be at 1,000 bed needed. I, I, I'm not even sure if those are accurate numbers right now. So again, the models are getting skewed by the assumptions. Uh, I'm wondering if they're gathering enough of the actual hard data, or if they're having difficulty collecting that. It just doesn't fit with what seems like is going on in the hospital. So we'll see. Um, I will check Iowa for you. Um, do I think the University of Washington numbers are inflated for political reasons? I, I hope not. He seemed like a good scientist to me. And so... Uh, I'm going to trust him as a scientist. And, uh, you know, models are models. They're not necessarily predictions of reality. Iowa, again, has this long protracted course of hospital resource use, though there is somebody, for some reason, University of Washington is concerned you might have a surge uh, because their confidence in intervals are rather wide. Uh, when you look at the number of cases, it certainly looks nice and low here. You're at around 500 confirmed infections as of May 1st. So that's doing pretty good. All right, you guys, thank you for stopping by. Thank you to Vinnie Tortorich. Um, so I have a picture uh, of the murder hornets that I sent you today. I, I did. It looks like, what, what do you want me to do with that? I'm going to show it. Okay. I just was like, wow. They're big. They're just crazy. They look like they'll fly your, they'll gather together and take, yeah, pick I up your kids or your dogs. Yeah, I do not want those in Southern California. Andrew, I did not see the preprint. I did not see it. I'm dying to see it. Please, uh, before I sign up, tell me where I can get it. Is it on, uh, did you, Susan, you may have sent it to drdrew.com slash. I'm uh, sorry, what is it? It's, it's from uh, Andrew. Uh, with the, oh, where is it? Andrew Ashka, yes, Ashka, yes, Ashka, yes, Ashka? yes, Ashkenazi. That guy. Yes. Okay, uh, let me I, write down the Al- name. Alkazvili. I know, I can't read. Alkazvili. Uh, I did not get it. Uh, you messaged me on the website. Okay, we'll search it down there. Oh, you did? Uh, yeah. You didn't send it to us on, online? Website. Website. Oh, it's on the w- Drew.com. Okay, it's on the it's the email on the website. It's in the email section, Andrew. Yeah, I'll find it. Close. That's my job. Oh, uh, close on your pronunciation. Alcazvili. 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 
Uh, Al Kazvali. <laughs> Why didn't he call? What in kind today? of name is that, Andrew? What? What? Andrew, it looks. It looks. Uh, you could have called in. Yeah, he it, could now. It, if it you looks. To. Well, I don't um, know if you want it right now. I so. signed off. Uh, okay. It looks. Uh, is it uh, like Georgian or something? Where, where is that? What is that? I'm gonna say. Uh, Kazakhstan. Russian. It's Russian, straight Russian. out. Okay. Well, we, I was. I was least. I was least in the Soviet Republic. All right, you guys. Thank <laughs> you for stopping by. We appreciate you being here. Uh, are we going to be in here tomorrow at a particular time? Oh, uh, let's mention on Friday. I don't have a, a banner for it yet, because we're, but you have uh, Cat Temp coming in on Friday. Mm-hmm. At uh, let's see, we're doing it at two thirty p.m. Cat and Temp, and then I don't have the banner, but she's from the Greg Gutfeld show. And then you had somebody else coming after that. We don't know yet. We're working on that, but I mean, it's we'll do another call-in show on Friday. Ask Dr. Drew, and you can always um, text your questions in advance if you want to the nine eight four to Dr. Drew. Also, um, what else? You have a podcast today that you're doing. A oh live, yeah, a live stream. Okay, so this is with if you guys are Shit's Creeks fan, I am working with em, uh, Emily Hampshire, who is Stevie from Shit's Creek. She is delightful, and you can find us t- in about an hour. Her podcast is Hump Day with Hampshire. Hump Day with Hampshire. YouTube.com slash The Actors Fund. It's a podcast that's a fundraiser for The Actors Fund. That's where it's going to be live. You can be uh, a part of the uh, giving at actressfund.org slash hump day. So it's hump day with Hampshire. We will be live at 2.15, I think. Today. It says 2 p.m. or 5 p.m. Eastern. Okay, 2 p.m. Today. Uh, Today. uh, Again, it is. And hopefully we'll get her on our show, too. Yes, maybe she'll be on on Friday. I'm hoping. I don't know. YouTube.com slash the actress fund and uh, hump day for Hampshire. I'm sure it'll be on the usual platforms for us. she has a lot of fun with this, and she's a delight, and I will be with her in about an hour. So uh, Very take, nice. take a little mini break, and we'll see you guys tomorrow at around uh, 12 o'clock, about the same time. We'll see you then.